A lot of this channel is devoted to pointing out how specific musical techniques achieve specific musical effects, and one of the most tried and true methods of producing a specific musical effect is the key change, or modulation. The act of establishing a home key, then picking up roots and jumping full on into another key always makes an impression on the listener, for better or worse. And today I've got the perfect soundtrack to showcase just what a modulation is and how they work, as well as some more advanced techniques to executing a modulation well. The soundtrack I'm talking about is of course Octopath Traveler. Octopath's soundtrack includes more key changes than maybe any other soundtrack I've ever listened to, with an average MPT, or modulations per tune, of a whopping 0.8. This is not a real metric of musical measurement, I just made up this number, I don't know the actual modulations per tune, I just made all this up right now. Modulating keys is a great way to create a sense of overarching motion in a piece of music, as you're literally stepping away from home to an entirely new place. The worst kind of key changes exist just to extend a song that's run out of ideas by repeating old ideas in a new key, and if you've heard of the truck driver's key change you know that this kind of blatant ploy has been responsible for eye rolls all over the world for hundreds of years. When used properly though, a key change can create a deep sense that the music is taking you on a journey, with specific and nuanced emotional effects tied to both which keys you modulate to relative to the original as well as just how you manage to get from point A to point B. Probably the most common key change there is, and one that you'll see all over pop music, game music, and Octopath Traveler's soundtrack is the move from 1 to 4, meaning if the key we start in is the key of 1, say A major, the key we change to is a fourth above, in this example, D major. This is exactly what happens in Tressa the Merchant's theme, which is split into two main sections that alternate with each other, the first in A and the second in D. Notice how the same melodic figure moves down to fit the new key before spinning off into its own new direction. This is a simple emotional effect, but it's super effective, giving the tune a blast of energy going into the new section that, to me at least, never gets old no matter how many times I hear it, which is probably why it's so common. Not all kinds of modulation are this simple, however. Some key changes are much more dramatic. In Ulbrich the Warrior's theme, the 6-bar intro is played in the home key of D minor once, then blasts up abruptly to the key of F minor before settling back into the key of D minor for the next section. This key change sounds much more dramatic than our first example, and this is due to two factors. First, the distance between the two keys we're moving between. The distance between the 1 and 4 keys, if you look at their respective key signatures, is only one note. That's different enough to have a noticeable effect on the music, but not enough to blow anyone away. The distance between the key of 1 and flat 3, however, as we see in Ulbricht's theme, is 3 notes, and jumping this distance has a much more obvious, dramatic effect on the music. The other factor at play here that makes this key change feel more drastic is the suddenness of the modulation. There's no warning, we're just chugging along in D minor when BAM! We're in F minor now! This kind of jarring key change can be effective, like in Ulbricht's case, but it definitely wouldn't fit every musical situation. So let's talk about some techniques you can use to shift keys more subtly. The most basic of modulation techniques are called pivot chords. A pivot chord is one that fits and functions in both the original key of the tune and the new destination key, providing a way to smooth out the transition from one key to another. 
In the Frostlands theme, we start in the key of B-flat minor and set up a repeating chord progression of 1, flat 6, flat 3, 5. At the end of the main section of the piece, this big F sus to F move sets up our expectations for our B-flat minor tonic to follow. However, this F not only functions as the 5 chord in our key of B-flat minor, but also simultaneously functions as the flat 7 chord in the key of G minor. Our expectations are dashed as this F winds up a flat 7 to 1 cadence to rocket us into the new key. Moving from B-flat minor to G minor is a pretty distant leap, but using this F chord to pivot between the two keys makes the transition feel a little smoother. This works because F fits functionally into both of these keys, and as we change keys, our ears retroactively hear that F chord as part of the key of G minor, even though we originally would have heard it relative to the key of B-flat minor. A second and more complicated way to make a big dramatic modulation feel more natural is to string together a few less dramatic key changes between point A and point B. In the track How Amusing, we've wandered from our home key of D minor all the way out to the key of B flat minor, and now we need to get back to the original key so that we can loop back to the beginning of the piece. Instead of jumping from B flat minor straight to D minor, which would be a very jarring transition between two very distant keys, we get this cycle of tonicizations that move us from B flat minor to F minor to C minor to G minor and then back to D minor, meaning that instead of our key signature jumping straight from five flats to one flat all at once, we simply drop one flat at a time as we move through each key on our way home. Now these keys are established through a simple flat 6 5 1 cadence, which is a very typical way of resolving to the tonic in a minor key. But the coolest part of this cycle to me is the way that the composer, Yasunori Nishiki, uses pivot chords in this transition to make these resolutions feel even more natural. Each flat 6 chord in the cycle is preceded by its secondary dominant chord, making it a series of flat 3 7 to flat 6 to 5 to 1 progressions. But if you look, these flat 3 7 chords each also fit perfectly with the key of the chord that came before it. So, B flat minor to A flat 7 to D flat is a perfectly normal cadence in the key of B flat minor. And B flat to C7 to F minor is a perfectly normal cadence in the key of F minor. Pivoting on the middle chord of this progression chains these keys together almost seamlessly, even though they're happening one after another so quickly. One of the more sophisticated ways to make a modulation more fluid is to foreshadow the key change in question. What do I mean by foreshadowing? As I mentioned earlier, the distance between two keys can be measured by the number of notes that change from one key to the other. It's the contrast between these notes that create the emotional effect associated with any given modulation, but it's also this contrast that makes a key change seem jarring when it happens too suddenly. By introducing one or more of these contrasting key notes earlier in a piece before the actual modulation happens, you give the listener's ears an opportunity to get used to them. This means that when the full-on key change does come, it feels a lot more natural than it otherwise would. The Flatlands theme uses two extremely common examples of mode mixture in the key of D to foreshadow a modulation to the key of G minor later on in the piece. First we have this exchange of 1 to minor 4 to 1, which is a common chord progression that introduces us to our first out of key note, B flat. Next, we see a walk up from the flat 3 to the 4 to the 5, a harmonic move that's more commonly found in rock music but shouldn't sound too foreign to anyone's ears. This introduces us to two more out of key notes, F natural and C natural.
This 8 bar section then repeats, training our ears to get even more used to these out of key notes in the context of the key of D major. This means that when the next section abruptly jumps to the key of G minor, even without using any sort of pivot chord or anything, it doesn't sound very abrupt at all. In fact, the first two chords in the section, G minor and F, are ones that we've already heard used before in the piece. Foreshadowing this key change makes it sound so much more natural than the kind of sudden, hit you over the head move we saw in Ulbricht's theme. Now, with all these techniques you can use to make a key change as smooth as possible, I want to leave you with a technique that I've noticed Nishiki likes to use to make his modulations a little less on the nose. What he'll do is he'll set up a really obvious key change and then, instead of resolving to the tonic of the new key right away, which is typical, he'll jump to the 4 chord of the new key, or the flat 6 chord if it's a minor key. Landing hard on this chord in a piece of music is always like hitting the cry button, and to set up a big key change and then hit you with one of these rather than the tonic just amplifies that effect. Check it out in Ophelia the Cleric's theme. We start in the key of F, with the end of the first section giving us a big F sus to F move. Using this sustained 4th to 3rd cliché sets up a blatantly obvious modulation to the key of the 4 chord B flat major, or maybe its relative minor key of G minor. And we do modulate to G minor in the very next bar, with this final F acting as a pivot chord, functioning as both the tonic of the original key and the flat 7 of the new key. But, rather than hitting us with a G minor chord right off the bat, making this a typical flat 7 to 1 cadence, we instead get a big colorful E flat major 9 chord that lays the emotion on thick. We can see this exact move, with almost the exact same chord progression even, used in Hanit the Hunter's theme. Starting in the key of F minor, this melancholy piano sets the mood before setting up a modulation to the much more distant key of D minor, using the same flat 7 pivot chord that we saw used in Ophelia's theme. This chord once again yanks our tonic resolution out from under our noses as this bass line walks down chromatically to the flat 6 chord of the new key, this B flat major 9 chord once again stacked with colorful extensions. It's a really cool effect, and I can tell why Nishiki likes to use it so much. Like I said, modulating key is a great way to create a sense of musical movement throughout a piece, and we feel this motion even in Octopath's relatively short themes as they take us out to new harmonic landscapes and back home again. The game also uses modulation techniques going into each boss fight as a way to seamlessly transition between the boss theme and whatever music was playing before it. It's really cool, but to hear more about that, you're going to have to go on over to GameScore Fanfare's channel to watch his excellent new video on that subject. Big thanks to patron Jack Bramhall for requesting this video topic. If you'd like to join him among the ranks of my handsome and charming patrons, feel free to check out my Patreon page here. If you'd just like to watch the Arctic Wasteland that is my social media presence, you can follow me on Twitter at 8BitMusicTheory. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you all next time.